Welcome to the 55th Annual Siemens Con Smythe Sports Celebrities Dinner and Auction in support of the Easter Seal Society. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Christine Simpson and Gord Stellick. Thank you very much, everybody, and welcome once again to the Siemens Consmice Sports Celebrities Dinner. We're so glad you could join us. Gord Stellick and I here, before we really get the evening underway, have two very special people we would like to introduce you to. And for those of you who were here last year, you will recognize both of our friends. I want to start with one of last year's Easter Seals ambassadors, Paul Minieri. Paul, it's great to see you again. I want to ask you, first of all, your year of being an Easter Seal ambassador, was there a highlight for you? Yes, there was. I really enjoyed the Consmice dinner and, and meeting all these fantastic sports celebrities. And, and I can't believe it has been a year tonight since I, since I, uh, since I went in the fantastic golf cart. Absolutely. Now, I want to ask you something else, too, because we're going to meet this year's Easter Seals ambassadors. Do you have any advice for the incoming ambassadors? Yes, I do. Good luck, have fun, and, and this is a year you won't ever forget. And remember, keep smiling. <laughs> Great advice. Now, Gord, I want to send it over to you, and you can introduce us to another special friend we have here. Well, the token Keep Smiling is apropos for both ambassadors and Heather Stewart. Uh, same thing. It's uh, been a wonderful year. And I'm just wondering, Heather, as far as memories, in a little while the new ambassadors are going to come in, what is it like that moment you actually enter the Con Smythe dinner? It's overwhelming. You don't really think that it's going to be that big. Like, you see it when you do the run-through, but when it's actually the time, it's like, whoa, there's a lot of people in here. <laughs> well, from that part, after one year, a full year, you've had a lot of events. Are there one or two events that have really stood out being memorable this past year? The Chris Pronger Golf Tournament uh, was one of my favorites. I became really good friends with Mike Clemens, and, like, he's awesome. We had so much fun. And the Toronto Maple Leaf Skate, it was something that my whole family enjoyed because my brother's a big sports fan, and so am I, and we kind of made my mom one too. Now, it sounds like too, after the Pronger tournament, you went to a Toronto Argonaut game and you got reacquainted with pinball. Yeah, we got there and we got to go down on the field and he turned over and saw us and he came running over to us. Well, very good. That speaks a lot about pinball Clemens that we know. And one thing is we should know, Heather got up 5 a.m. train, got up 5 a.m. this morning, came from Sarnia by train. You think she'd rest, but you're at the Eaton Center all afternoon. To, was the shopping trip successful? Yeah. What'd you get? Uh, I got some summer stuff and a new pair of pants. Sounds like you did quite well. How about a round of applause? Our outgoing ambassadors, Paul and Heather. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming our Master of Ceremonies for the 2006 Siemens Con Smythe Sports Celebrities Dinner and Auction, a colleague of mine at Rogers Sportsnet, Rob Falls. Rob, come on up. It's all yours. Thank you, Jerry. Well, that hardly put any pressure on me at all. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. It's a pleasure to be here for the 55th Con Smythe Dinner. Uh, you know, last year you had Jesse Palmer, the Bachelor, so I'm glad to see you stuck with Handsome. So Tyler Stewart was the MC, so you had The Bachelor and the Bare Naked Ladies. No wonder they're all smiling on the program from last year. So I am looking forward to this. As a broadcaster, there are many things you want to do. The Olympics, of course, one of them, and the Winter Olympics coming up in Italy very shortly. You know, I've always wanted to, to host the Con Smythe Dinner, and a couple of other things, of course, a broadcaster wants to do. Uh, you always want to work one day a week and get huge money for it, but Don Cherry has that job, so that's out of the question. You, you want to control 900 people 
and realize that they are not eating until you let them eat, which is kind of a power trip that you always want. And you can always see yourself on the big screen that you can do here and realize that you have a really big head. So I'm very concerned about that. We'll talk about that later. But I'm delighted to be here. You're going to meet our Easter Seal ambassadors. They are two very intelligent and wonderful ambassadors for Easter Seals. You'll meet them later. But to be with these people here at the head table, these athletes, we're talking about athletes with stamina, endurance, tireless dedication, and raw nerves, and that's just the poker player. So really, it's great to be here. By my count, at this head table, we have 15 Stanley Cups represented, four Olympic medals, three of them gold, 10 Canadian championships, eight world championships, eight LPGA titles, a world junior hockey championships, three Grey Cups, three National Lacrosse League championships, a number of Hall of Fames of all different types. There's a Gold Cup champion, a guy who's won seven million bucks in poker winnings, and Jim Ralph. One of these things is not like the other. But you know what I think we should do is that because I've had the opportunity of watching this dinner from where you sit and, and munch salad and ignore the MC, I thought it would be a great idea to maybe meet the uh, head table. And I've never ever been able to do this, so I thought, let's get up close and personal with the head table. First of all, first guy we're going to meet, of course, is with the Toronto Blue Jays. And who doesn't think the Blue Jays have improved so much over the past year? They're a fabulous team. And of course, one of the reasons is their great shortstop, Tony Fernandez. Oh, Russ Adams is here, and he's a terrific player. Negreanu is here, and he told me that two sevens beat a full house. So, you lied to me, there's the 20, I appreciate it. Ross Rebliati, a gold medalist from the Olympics. That's an amusing cologne you have, Ross. Just wanted to let you know, this is a no secondhand smoke building. Just wanted to let you know. Billy Smith is here, and of course, Billy Smith, when he played in the National Hockey League, his crease was sacrosanct. He's, in fact, even circled it around here and hit Kiprios once, which was only fair. Watch your elbows. I just want you to that. Nick Kiprios. Here we go, a colleague of mine. This is a guy who's made the transition from being an NHL player to a TV guy. And look, now he's got perfect hair and a great scowl. Show him the scowl. Show him the scowl. There we go. <laughs> Nick is a devoted father as well. He built a backyard ice rink for his family. The only backyard rink that has a penalty box. <laughs> Swear to God, and he's never been out of it yet. Six-time Canadian figure skating champion Jennifer Robinson. Jennifer, thank you for coming. Craig Forrest, you know, a soccer player, and he loves the game of soccer, but every time he gets lucky, he always yells, Go! Go, 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 go! Neighbors hate him, not very happy. John Ferguson, who thinks he can still take Wendell Clark, and probably can. Sandra Post, who I worked with at Canada AM, she told me that uh, on a series we did called Golf Tips, I said, do I have a future in golf? She said, yeah, there's an opening in the pro shop. Thank you very much. You'll meet this beautiful woman later. This is Caitlin. She's much funnier than I am, so don't worry about this. Let's take a look down here, because this is a good-looking squad. Daryl Sittler, who earlier this week, 30 years ago this week, scored 10 points in a game against the Boston Bruins. But what is forgotten in that whole thing, that this is also the week that 30 years ago, goaltender Dave Reese of the Boston Bruins played his last game in the NHL. I don't want to put any pressure on you. You got 10 points in a game. That was good. Kobe Bryant, 81. <laughs> Wendell Clark, Geraldine Heaney says she could take you. Everybody loves the Manning family. You know Archie Manning, you know Peyton Manning, you know Eli Manning, and I have no idea who this Manning is. <laughs> Geraldine Heaney? He beat the crap out of John Ferguson. Adrian Smith, it's great to see the Smith family together. Billy and Adrian finally together. We were worried about you. <laughs> Steve Shutt of the Montreal Canadiens, and Ryan's going to love this because he's a Montreal Canadiens fan. This man has Stanley Cups, but people don't realize he was a fabulous polo player, an outstanding polo player. He had to give it up. The horses kept drowning. So <laughs> that was a good joke. He told me. Uh, Daniel Legali, gold medal winner from the Olympics. Wrestling, here he is. This man is fabulous. We carry wrestling on uh, Sportsnet. It's fake. <laughs> He's not mad, is he? Mike Foligno, everybody remembers Mike Foligno when he scored a goal. Remember he'd jump around like a maniac wearing that great big gazoo helmet? He did that tonight when he got a real good parking spot here at the hotel. 
John Tavares is a 15-year-old wonder kid. He's next to Mike Foligno and Jim Ralph. Guess who's got the best career right now? Uh, John has a uh, 8 o'clock curfew. Hold on just a sec. That's good. You're good. You're all good. And your name would be... What the heck are you doing here? Can I see your ticket, please? Where's the security? Guys, make sure he doesn't steal the silverware. This is all right. Jim Ralph will be along later. I'm not sure why, but he will. Ladies and gentlemen, big hand for your 2006 Con Smythe head table. You're watching the 55th Annual Siemens Con Smythe Sports Celebrities Dinner. It's time now to meet some of the outstanding celebrities that are on our head table this evening. And the man who will start things off doing the interviewing for us is a well-known man in this Toronto community. Uh, he's really best known as Wajit Khan's best friend, but some of you might know him as the morning co-host on the Fan 590 with Don Landry. He was also a former general manager of the Toronto Maple Leafs. And it's strange, as he got skinnier and skinnier, his sideburns got bigger and bigger. I can't explain that. Ladies and gentlemen, to talk to some of our celebrities on the head table, Gord Stelic of the Fan 590. Feisty Nick Kiprios brought a sandpaper edge to an NHL career encompassing 442 regular season and 34 playoff games with the Capitals, Whalers, Rangers, and Leafs. He suffered a career-ending head injury on September 1997, retiring as a member of his hometown Leafs. The highlight of his career, 1994, when he was part of a special team that brought the Stanley Cup back to the Rangers for the first time since 1940. Kiprios remains close to the game he loves as an outspoken hockey analyst for Rogers Sportsnets. Ladies and gentlemen, my uh, partner at Sportsnet, Nick Kiprios. Wow. Seems just like yesterday. Big radio guy comes into Sportsnet studio for the first time. We thought it was a little extra special. We ordered, uh, what, three pepperoni pizzas. First hit, Gord's on camera, looking real serious, giving this real serious answer about the Leafs. I look over. There's tomato paste all over his chin. <laughs> Those were the old days. Sadly, that's a <laughs> oh, true yeah. story. Yeah, Doesn't he look great? No more pizzas. I can't order pizzas anymore at Sportsnet. Well, thanks very much. And we're going to, uh, going to carry on service uh, as well. So we keep things moving. So we appreciate your attention as we uh, talk to the guests who've given their time to come tonight to support the dinner. And Kipper, first of all, the backyard rink. Uh, Rob Falls alluded to it. Yes. Not the best year to have a backyard rink in Toronto. No, I went out and I went big. I got boards. Falls, you uh, mentioned the penalty box. And uh, one thing missing the weather. But last few days have been pretty good. So I'm going to salvage something in February and uh, we'll, we'll get you out there with your artificial hip and uh, it'll be great. <laughs> Thanks very much. Talk about uh, special nights. Tonight's a special night, but certainly you had a big part. Marc Messier, a great night. A lot was done for charity, but you, some people argue the uh, greatest leader of any team and what that was all about in New York City. Yeah, that was uh, real special. Uh, when you take a look at uh, great men in our history, I think he's going to rank right up there. Uh, prior to that, I was able to get down to Hilton Head and spend some time with him, and that was real special for me too because I always knew there was a side of him that really... Uh, over the past 25 years wasn't necessarily shown. Um, he always had that look that at any time he can give you an elbow to your head and rip it off. 
but there was also a side to him that uh, he's got this big belly laugh, uh, great sense of humor, uh, quality guy, family guy, as he's always had his family around him. And now it's great that uh, he's starting his own family as well. So a uh, real, real uh, pleasure play with the man and then also uh, spend some time with him as a, as a broadcaster. One quick hockey question, a guy like Brian McCabe, playing so well with the Maple Leafs and is going to be probably a big part of the Canadian Olympic team. Why has his game come together? Well, I think uh, first and foremost, uh, you know, his confidence level has gone up uh, a few notches and you can't underestimate what Brian Leach meant to him, even though Brian Leach was only a member of the Toronto Maple Leafs a short time. Uh, Brian Leach will be regarded as one of the greatest players in history and for Brian to be associated with a guy like that um, really helped him a lot and I think that just carried over uh, into this season and Brian now McCabe is in a situation much like Brian Leach was most of his career to, to really carry a hockey club on his shoulders and, uh, and, and be the go-to guy and uh, there's no doubt he's responded really well this year. Well you're the go-to guy at Sportsnet. Nick Kiprios ladies and gentlemen. Thanks, Thank you They call him Prairie Dog. Born in Calgary with a residence in Sherwood Park, Alberta, Blaine Manning is also a bond trader in Toronto and a gifted offensive forward for the National Lacrosse League champion Toronto Rock. The NLL Rookie of the Year in 02 was obtained by the Rock from the Calgary Roughnecks and has since been a perennial top scorer. Manning earned his third consecutive NLL second team All-Pro selection in 05 when he was second overall in the National Lacrosse League scoring with 105 points. Blaine Manning of the Toronto Rock. That's pretty interesting. So you're a bond trader. So if they don't take your advice, you've got a special way of making them buy. Is that right? Yeah, well, something like that. But uh, something to keep me busy during the day anyways. Now, how do you keep the passion going? Guys like Nip Kiprios, Wendell Clark, Daryl Sittler, you know, play sports where you make millions of dollars, hundreds of thousands of dollars. What keeps you going? Uh, just for the love of the game, I mean, it kind of sounds like cliche, but uh, we grew up playing it and uh, there was never a professional league growing up, so uh, you didn't play it uh, dreaming of doing it for a living, so uh, it's something I get to do now and uh, make a little money on the side and uh, you get to be with uh, teammates and, uh, and, and, you know, it's fun and enjoyable and it uh, keeps me young as well, so. Tough thing is when you win a whack of championships, everybody wants you to do it again. What's uh, the Toronto Rocks' chances and what are the biggest tasks this year? Oh, well, we got off to a tough start, but uh, we still have a very good team. Uh, a lot of guys that we had last year when we won, so uh, we just got to get back on track, and we've started the last couple games we won, so uh, we're moving in the right direction and uh, just keep kind of going forward. So, You know, great people in the game of lacrosse, and certainly a great one passed away in Les Bartley a while ago. Talk about Les and talk about the uh, Sanderson era that's taken over. Yeah, well, Les, uh, I mean, he's um, what an unbelievable person he was. Uh, huge influence on my life. Uh, he was responsible for bringing me to Toronto. He traded for me, and uh, at the time, it wasn't a very popular decision. But uh, he was, I mean, just he's just a great guy all around. And uh, and uh, he's obviously uh, he's passed passed on. But uh, now we have Terry running uh, running things, and, and he does a great job. He's a tough guy, and he's uh, he's hard nosed, and he tells it uh, how it is. And uh, I got a lot of respect for him, and so does everybody else in the dressing room. Well, Blaine, good, uh, good luck, The Rock, trying to win another lacrosse, last lacrosse league championship. Blaine Manning, everybody. Thanks, Thanks very much. At the age of 16, Coquitlam-born Craig Forrest headed overseas for a rewarding career as a pro soccer goalkeeper. He went from trainee to starter with Ipswich Town, celebrating a Division II crown in 91-92, becoming the first Canadian to play in the English Premiership. He also represented Canada internationally 56 times. He was tournament goalkeeper and MVP during Canada's stunning 2000 Gold Cup title. Craig now spends his time as an analyst for Rogers Sportsnet. Well, another colleague from Rogers Sports said in Craig Forrest, and uh, Craig, the question everybody asks when they're playing soccer, when they love soccer like you do, they're passionate. Will it ever catch on in Canada at the grassroots level? Well, I think at the grassroots level, it has caught on. The, the word hasn't caught on is professionally uh, as, part of, as part of a spectator sport. So I think uh, for Canada, with the MLS team coming to Toronto, which is going to be exciting, the Under-20 World Cup coming to Toronto uh, for to Canada in 2007. Our women's national team has done a terrific job as far as building the sport in this country, as well as our men from time to time. 
Uh, unfortunately, we haven't seen enough uh, professional soccer players uh, in sight uh, in the media here, primarily because they're out of sight and out of mind. And playing in Europe, they've been doing really well. And I think some of them deserve some sort of you know, exposure in Canada. Not that they're desperate for it, but they, I think they deserve it. And they've uh, been doing a terrific job sort of holding and carrying the flag over in Europe. Now, one thing I noticed, you're a guy who was a keeper, played overseas, and there's no more equipment in soccer. They still wear the same equipment, but every penalty kick used to be an automatic goal, and I see more and more <laughs> the goaltending is getting better in soccer. Why is that? Well, you know, I don't know. I, I think the, the players are generally uh, getting more, it's becoming more of a science goaltending, and uh, I, I'd be quite in favor of making the goals a little bit bigger. I think that back in the day, the, the goals were made a size that created a lot of opportunities and a lot of goals, and I think with, the, with how good the goalkeepers are becoming and, and uh, it becoming such a fine science that I think that the uh, the goals could be made better and maybe make the game a little bit better. I know FIFA would be dead against it and the rest of the world, but it would certainly create some more goals, that's for sure. Uh, you'll be busy for Rogers Sports Set this summer. Handicap the World Cup. You may, off you may offend a few people, a few people may like your picks, but <laughs> how do you see it going? Well, you know, it's so hard to bet against Brazil. Brazil is such a wonderful side and, you know, it just ooze ability and technical skill. And There's a few other teams in there that could do very well, as we see, saw in the European Championship with Greece winning that any team on any given day can beat anybody. And uh, I think there's some quality teams out there. England's got an outside opportunity. they got a good young squad. Czech Republic look good. Some of the African countries will always surprise. You just never know which one will do that. So overall, it's going to be a great tournament, and uh, it always is. And we'll have to see what happens in the end. But it is very difficult to go against a team like Brazil. Of course, we'll look forward to Craig's coverage on Sportsnet. Craig Forrest, ladies and gentlemen. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Craig. Granted exceptional player status last May and drafted first overall by the OHL's Oshawa Generals at the age of 14, Oakville native John Tavares is the real deal. Tavares was the OHL's Rookie of the Month in December and was averaging 1.15 points per game in the first half of the season with the Gens. The gifted center says goal scorer best describes him. And oh yes, the NHL entry draft is 2009 and the countdown is on. Well, we got some NHL players of the past. We got the uh, talk about the look of the future as John Tavares joins us. And just wonder, you look a little bit at, and follow Sidney Crosby's career. Have you ever talked to Sidney about those types of pressures? No, I've actually never met Sidney, but, uh, you know, just watching him and just you can learn so much from him, you know, how hard he works and how much he loves the game and how well he handles all the pressure. I think for you right now, it has to be nice being in a good program like Oshawa. You know, obviously, we got a good young team. Uh, you know, we're not doing too well right now, but I think it's because we're young. You know, uh, good teams don't develop overnight. So uh, these next couple of years, you know, we'll start developing. And hopefully, become a very strong team. Uh, I know to go back to Sydney or anybody, he wanted to play for the Montreal Canadiens. People generally have a favorite team. If John Tavares could pick an NHL team to play for, who would it be? Uh, definitely be Toronto. Toronto's my favorite team ever since I was a little kid, and uh, it'd be a dream come true to play for the Leafs one day. Well, let's hope they work a trade out because they'll have to finish down in the standings to get you. So here we have all this great past, all this great future. Is there something you don't do well? I mean, do you struggle at school? Is, is there something or just everything come easy? Um, I'd say video games. Uh, video me games? And my roommates always play and I'm always the one losing and then I just get too frustrated. I just throw the controller just quick because, uh, you know, it's my system and you think I'd be winning, but uh, I definitely get uh, pushed around there. It's good to hear there's a God. There's something out there. Ladies and gentlemen, outstanding junior hockey player, NHL of the future, John Tavares. It would be hard to find a rookie who made more of an impact on the city of Toronto than Wendell Clark. In 1985, he came armed with a wicked wrist shot and willingness to hit, instantly becoming a fan favorite. He was named captain of the Leafs in 91 and led the team to within one game of the Stanley Cup final in 93. Traded to Quebec in 94, he would return twice to the Leafs via trade in 96 and then as a free agent in 2000 before retiring later that year. And you know something, Clarky, what I remember, this is the very building, I don't know if this is the hall, but back in 1985, one year only, the draft was held at the Metro Toronto Convention Centre. It wasn't a big crowd, but it was a loud crowd, and first overall, 
We'll hopefully get to Barris down the road if you're first overall, but that year uh, we used the pick very wisely to select Wendell Clark and the whole building erupted, put the leaf sweater on and we never looked back. You remember that moment? Yeah, it actually was uh, right here in the building. Uh, Lotel was the, was the hotel down the end of the hall then and uh, this is where it all started, became a Toronto Maple Leaf. The draft was here, I think the first time the draft was in Toronto, not in Montreal. Uh, so a very, uh, very exciting time. Now, coming back the last time, did that make the perfect end to your career? Well, it was nice. It was, I started here, played 12, uh, I guess, 12 of the 15 years that I played hockey and, and getting a chance to come back and play in the playoffs, play in the new building and uh, kind of come full circle. And I knew I was going to finish and uh, retire and live in, in the Toronto area. So uh, it was very fitting to end, I think, uh, being able to finish playing here in Toronto. Now, I know you've been a supporter of the Consumite Dinner for a number of years. The Hound Line was here. You've been here about five or six times. And uh, we met your folks that day. Les and Elma were here for the draft. Now being a parent, you've got three kids. Uh, how's that changed your perspective, whether it's dinners like this or the, the way you go about life? Well, I think everything means a lot more. Whenever you, uh, as soon as you have a family and you start raising kids, you start looking at the big picture. And uh, when I was here uh, as a young guy, 18 years old, first time in the city, same uh, same tuxedo I'm wearing today. My button doesn't do up around my neck anymore. But uh, it just, uh, like you say, it opens your eyes to everything. As soon as you uh, get a little older, get a family, uh, you start thinking the big picture. What about this year? What are you thinking now that you're an employee, you're on the payroll? Maple Leafs this year as far as the playoffs and a possible Stanley Cup run. Well, right now we got the uh, the eighth playoff spot. we got two games against uh, the Rangers coming up just before the Olympic break. and. It'd be great just to uh, finish on a, on a high. That'd make, I think, four wins in a row and uh, have the break, get some of our injuries back. That's been our, our biggest thing is uh, when you're not deep on, on the depth and you get a couple injuries, it's really hurt our, hurt our lineup. So hopefully over that break, we can get healthy and go into the uh, last quarter of the season there uh, ready to play. Well, I'll tell you, the three Maple Leafs who are more popular now than when they played are Johnny Bauer, Daryl Sittler, and former Leaf captain Wendell Clark. Thanks, Wendell. Thanks a lot, guys. Ladies and gentlemen, I can't tell you how much of an honor it is for me to be here on behalf of Siemens and to say a few words. But first and foremost, and I know you'll meet the ambassadors later, but I can't tell you how much of a thrill it was for me to meet them earlier. Uh, they're two lovely, lovely people. And I tell you, Caitlin, I learned a lot about her and I learned that her favorite color is, is aqua or teal. And that's kind of cool because that's our corporate color. And, I'm wearing a piece of clothing somewhere, I told her, and that's our secret about what my color is. And, and, and of course, on this side, you know, Ryan, with, re with respect to special colors, I found out it was orange. And this tie is for you, Ryan, especially for you. Right on. And if you want, you can ask Wendell if he wants to borrow it. Uh, for those of you who know me, one of my favorite sayings is, if it was easy, anybody could do it. And at Siemens Canada, when it comes to support, we have to view it in terms of what it means and what it pays off. And support is very difficult. And when I thought about what I was going to speak tonight, I said support is an excellent word. It's simple, it carries a lot of weight, and it means a lot of things to a lot of people. But at the end of the day, I figured the best way to describe it is to have an experiment with everybody here. So I'm going to ask everybody, I know you have a glass in front of you. Pick your glass up in your hand, please. Pick a glass up. It'll only take a second, just pick a glass. It can be empty or full. Now, I'm going to ask you a question, and my question is, I, I don't expect an answer, but how, how much do you think that glass of wine or water weighs? Well, I, I didn't know, and actually when I was talking to Ryan this afternoon, he told me it's about 250 to 300 grams. And this is just a little less than 300 grams. Now, the reason I asked you to hold that water up in your hand, because in thinking about support, if you hold that glass for a minute, it's, it's relatively easy to do. But if I ask you to hold that glass for about half an hour, I know you could do it, but I think your arm would start to hurt. And if I asked you to hold that glass for an entire day, I don't think you could do it by yourself without the help of a team. And that's the way we view support at Siemens, is a team you have to have dedication, you have to have support and commitment. And it's important in realizing that to understand your commitment as a team. If you were to pass the glass you're holding right now to the person next to you, 
and you did that every 30 seconds, how long you could do that for, and that's the key to success. So on a daily basis, if you held a glass of water for just a minute in your hand, you thought about that as success in terms of support, the same thing could be said for every dollar you raise tonight is what you're giving back to Easter Seals, and your support is so necessary. So with that glass in your hand, I'd like you to raise a little bit higher and toast yourselves. On behalf of Siemens in Canada, you are doing a fantastic job for raising money for Easter Seals tonight and every day forward. Thank you. It's time now to meet some more of the celebrities and we want to introduce you now to our other very special guest host on the evening. I've had the good fortune of knowing uh, this beautiful woman for many, many years. Uh, I was the play-by-play -play voice of the London Knights for some years and her brother Dave was on the team. So I can remember this young lady running around the London Gardens when she was just well, she was 27 at the time, so you guys can do the math. So, no, I'm just kidding. She's a member of our Hockey Central panel. She is one of the finest interviewers in our business. She not only works for us on, on Hockey Central, on Rogers Sportsnet, but she has done work for ESPN and OLN. And, yes, of course, she is a former Miss Teen London. Ladies and gentlemen, with more of our celebrity interviews, Christine Simpson. On February 8, 1998, Ross Rebliati made Olympic history in Nagano, Japan by winning the first ever gold medal for snowboarding in the giant slalom. In Canada and around the world, fans of the sport celebrated the Olympic milestone. In 05, he was inducted into the BC Sports Hall of Fame. That same year, Ross announced his plans to compete in the 2010 Olympic Winter Games at his home territory, Vancouver Whistler. He has carved out a name for himself, inspired others, and helped establish a new exciting sport on the global stage. Please welcome Mr. Ross Rebliati. Now, Ross, when you think about snowboarding, I mean, today snowboarding is very mainstream, but back when you started to do it, I mean, how kind of out there were you as a snowboarder? Well, I'll tell you what, um, I started riding in 1987, and uh, we weren't allowed to snowboard in Canada in 1987 so I actually had to travel down to uh, Mount Baker Washington and it wasn't until the next year when uh, Blackcomb opened up uh, their doors to snowboarding so to, to have uh, had the opportunity to compete in the Olympics in my favorite sport was uh, pretty amazing and you certainly made history in winning uh, the very first gold medal in, in doing it can you can you take us back to what that was I mean it was an absolute media circus for you not only because of your exploits on the hill, but off. Take, yep. a, take us through what that experience was like for you. Well, it was definitely, uh, you know, just when we found out we were going to the Olympics and in a sport that we thought was never, ever going to make it in the first place and was barely allowed on the slopes uh, when I started, uh, you know, that in itself was amazing. And to, to have won the Olympics was uh, something that I could never really um, put into words. It was a surreal experience. And, and then, of course, I had my whole controversy that, that came about afterwards. And, um, you know, that was uh, going to be hard to put that one into words, too. I, you know, <laughs> I definitely don't regret anything that I ever did. And I don't, I don't look back on it and, and have any bad memories. But uh, we had a couple of tense moments, for sure. I can imagine. Well, you're still certainly in the public eye. Actually, I don't know if any of you saw David Letterman just a couple of nights ago. You were on his top 10 list, so with the Olympics just around the corner, no one's forgotten about you. No, it's been, uh, it's been a great ride, and uh, I've had the opportunity to uh, meet a lot of interesting people and to be a part of uh, you know, great events like this one, too. So uh, it's an honor. Well, just lastly, I understand with the Olympics, obviously, in 2010 in your backyard, Vancouver Whistler, I hear you're planning on competing. That's right. I've had my, uh, I've been training for the last couple of years and I'm getting ready to uh, compete internationally in the next couple of years and uh, looking forward to 2010. So, Well, we'll be cheering you on in Vancouver. Thank Ross Rebliati, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. 
Only five others have played more games for the Argonauts than defensive back Adrian Smith, a stalwart on the defensive unit since 96. He's a six-time Eastern Division All-Star and a two-time All-Canadian. He tied an Argos record in 05 when he returned his fifth career interception for a touchdown against the Tiger Cats. A big play defender, Smith helped the Argos to Grey Cup titles in 96, 97, and 04. A pillar in numerous community initiatives, he was born in Kansas City, Missouri, and recently became a Canadian citizen. Now, this gives you an idea of just how unique an individual Adrian Smith is. When he read it was black tie, he shows up with a purple one. But you know what? That, that's, that's good. You've got your, your, your own unique style. Well, actually, this isn't my style. This is, uh, I was over Don Landry's house earlier today. Right. So this is his tie and his handkerchief. So thank you, Don, for letting me borrow your, borrow your, your outfit, buddy. Appreciate that. And you borrowed his hairstyle, too, I can I did see. borrow his hairstyle. Yeah. But I have a little bit more hair than he does. Just, just a, a bit. bit. Now, I know you were born in Kansas City, Missouri, and you're, you're still in the process, I believe, of becoming a Canadian citizen. Now, tell me, what, what kind of process is that like? Well, it's, it's an extensive pro process. Uh, it's not a process, it's a process, extensive <laughs> process. Um, took the test last year. It takes about 12 to 15 months to complete. Uh, so I took the test, got my fingerprints done out the way, and somewhere around April or May this year, I should officially become a Canadian citizen. Well, and we are very happy to have you join us. Absolutely. Now, I know last year with the Argos, after the success you'd had the year before, had to be, oh, I just saw the bling oh, bling there. Oh, did you there. see this? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm, I'm sorry. sorry. I was just blinded momentarily. <laughs> now, tell me, last season obviously came a little bit short, but now you're getting ready for next season. Pinball still at the helm. Uh, great things to look forward to for the Argonauts this season? I think so. Uh, I think we still have a lot of people coming back this year. We still have three or four people that we need to re-sign for free agency. So. Uh, in this day and age, it's uncommon to have the same team together for, for a year. And we've, uh, I think we're going to have the opportunity to have the same team together for three years in a row. So if we can keep strong in that and keep in the same direction, I think we'll have a very successful season again this year. Well, and I, I know, as you mentioned, Don Landry. We've all certainly heard you on the morning show with Gord Stelic and Don Landry. You do pretty well. You, well. Know, you know, Gord really carries Don. Don's <laughs> really not there. It's really the Gord Stelic show, and Don is just really along for the ride. I think there's going to be uh, some exchange of money you know, sometime at the end. No, probably somewhere tomorrow he's going to talk bad about me. Yeah, I was going to say, just, tune into the feeling. fans tomorrow morning, everybody. <laughs> Adrian Smith, the Toronto Argonauts, thank you so much for joining us thank tonight. Thank you very much. <laughs>Six-time Canadian ladies figure skating champion Jennifer Robinson competed in seven world championships and the 02 Olympic Winter Games in Salt Lake City where she placed seventh. This season, Jennifer is coaching and doing choreography at the Mariposa School of Skating in Barrie. She's skating professionally in shows and tours. Born in Godrich, Ontario, she began skating at the age of eight, admiring Canadian ladies figure skating icons Elizabeth Manley and Jose Chouinard. Jennifer's passion and talent allowed her to forge a championship career in her own right. Welcome to Jennifer Robinson. Now, Jennifer, as we are now on the eve of the Torino Olympics, let, let me take you back to your experience at Salt Lake City. Uh, tell me, what was that like for you competing at an Olympic Games? It was amazing because it was really my first and one and only experience that I got, and I knew it was my only experience. So I made sure to hit all the hockey games, all the speed skating events. I had my own job to do as well, but I wanted to hit the opening ceremonies and jump up and down to make sure that my parents and everybody could see me on TV and that is my Olympic experience in a nutshell. Absolutely. I know you have a vested interest in, in watching this uh, Torino Olympics. Give us an idea of what we can look forward to with the Canadian ladies. Well, I know the uh, the Canadian champion, Joanie Rochette, she's personally my dark horse favorite and it's not just a Canadian bias. She really has everything that's necessary to win a medal at these Olympic Games. So with this new judging system, I think that she'll be um, well credited for all of her capabilities. And I know you're still very involved in the figure skating world, living up uh, just in Barrie, Ontario. Give us an idea of what you're involved in these days. Well, right now I've been touring in the States with uh, Smucker Stars on Ice. So I've been touring with Jamie Soleil and David Pelche, Kurt Browning and all of the Canadian favorites. And then we'll be coming back up to Canada once the Olympics are over and uh, touring from Halifax to Victoria. So I've really been enjoying the fact that I haven't had to quit skating cold turkey and love and performing for everyone. Well, and we appreciate that you made the time to be with us here tonight. Thank you, Jennifer Robinson, everyone.
It's in the cards that poker champion Daniel Negreanu is here tonight. His favorite Canadian city is Toronto, his hometown, and he loves the Maple Leafs. And leaving Vegas for some R&R back home allows him to drink some of the great smooth Canadian brew he misses. Daniel just won the WPT Borgata event, paying over $1.1 million, putting him second all-time on the money leaders list. The win gives Daniel a stranglehold on the Player of the Year award. Congratulations, Daniel, and cheers. Daniel, poker has absolutely exploded in popularity in recent years. I gotta ask you, how does a, a guy who grew up in Toronto, Ontario, end up one of the top money winners in the World Poker Tour? Well, you know, it's funny, Toronto is without a doubt the most multicultural city in the world. And one of the, th one of the uh, attributes you have to have to be a good poker player is the ability to read people. And being exposed to so many different cultures growing up, it made it an e easy transition for me to go to Vegas and beat up on those Yankees. <laughs> now, were you always good, or like, did you kind of have some rough starts along the way? In well, your I will say that probably when I was 21 years old and went to Las Vegas, I felt, you know, I was a cocky young kid and figured I'm going to take Vegas by, you know, by the tail. And um, unfortunately, the tail was between my legs as I, you know, sort of scampered home, a little bit embarrassed. But I, you know, I kept going back. I didn't quit. Felt like I, I worked on my game back in Toronto. Uh, grew, grew up here, playing mostly here, and then just kept going back. And one day. It all made sense. And, well, and I know you're a very proud Canadian, a proud Torontonian. We, we saw you playing right. uh, in your Toronto Maple Leaf jersey. Right. T tell me why you, you do that. Well, you know, one of the things, um, I, I'm, I'm a proud Canadian, absolutely, and, and one of the few Canadians that actually play on the Pro Poker Tour. And um, wearing a hockey jersey is the best way to let the whole world know that I'm truly Canadian, because hockey is a Canadian game. The Canadian hockey jerseys, the Wendell Clark jersey, if you'll ever sign one for me. Uh, <laughs> And, and things like that. You know, I, I take a lot of pride in, in, in somewhat representing Canada out there on the tour. What is the most you have ever won at a tournament? Uh, in December 2004, I captured the Player of the Year award, uh, and when I won 1.8 million in that tournament. It's four days' work, you know, but it was pretty good. Not bad, <laughs> not yeah. bad odds. And what is coming up for you? Um, well, right now I'm uh, I'm here for a few days, and then I'm going to head back to Los Angeles and go right back on the tour. And our, our World Championships, the World Series of Poker, starts pretty soon after that, so I'm, you know, gearing up for that. Well, best of luck, and again, Daniel, thank you for joining us here tonight. It's a pleasure to be here. Daniel Negreanu, everybody. We want to welcome right now to the main podium the chair of Easter Seals, Board of Director, ladies and gentlemen, Greg Smith. Good evening to all of you. On behalf of the Easter Seals Society and my colleagues on the board, and we welcome you and thank you all for being here this evening. Each year, this event kicks off our fundraising initiatives that help fund essential equipment and provide confidence building experiences for children living with physical disabilities. In 2005, Easter Seals faced many challenges that were overcome with the support of our lawyer, loyal donors. With your continued support, we will be able to meet the needs of Easter Seal kids across the province. I'd like to thank our 2005 Provincial Easter Seal Ambassadors and their families for never allowing us to lose focus, attending the many events throughout the year, always being available while still maintaining great marks at school is not an easy job. They more than ever stepped up to the plate. Paul Mignetti, and Heather Stewart are two outstanding young people with very bright futures. Easter Seals is very proud of them and we thank them very much as well as their parents. It is a pleasure to share the podium tonight It's very important the parents work very hard with their, with their children. It's, uh, it, tonight it's a pleasure to share the podium with so many celebrated sports and media personalities. I know that your successes are an inspiration to all of us. Thank you for your participation. Because, because of you, this evening sells, sells out every year, making it one of the most popular events of the season. To our dinner committee, Scott Morrison and Vice Chair Nelson Millman, Thank you for another year of outstanding commitment to our organization and for your leadership. And to the entire dinner committee, both staff and volunteers, 
This event would not be the success it is without you. Thank you to our title sponsor, Siemens Canada, for your continued generosity with this event. And to all of our media partners, Fan 590, Rogers Television, Slam Sports, the Toronto Sun, and Rogers Sportsnet, thanks for spreading the word, the word uh, so well for us. Much appreciation to Mario Forgioni and the Mississauga Ice Dogs, and our platinum sponsors, Labatt's Breweries of Canada, Internet, Intercontinental Toronto Centre, and Rogers Cable. Your support makes a tremendous difference in the lives of children with physical disabilities. The dollars raised tonight will allow Easter Seals kids to experience fun and freedom. Thank you. You're watching the 55th Annual Siemens Con Smythe Sports Celebrities Dinner. Toronto-born Steve Shutt was inducted into the Hockey Hall of Fame in 1993. He patrolled left wing for the Canadians from 1972 to 84 and is the first half to score 60 goals in a season. It was a club record that was tied a season later by linemate Guy Lafleur. A five-time Stanley Cup winner, Shutt scored 424 goals, 393 assists for 817 points in 930 regular season games with Montreal and Los Angeles and added 50 goals and 98 points in the 99 Stanley Cup playoff games. Well, another NHL Hockey Hall of Famer, ladies and gentlemen, Steve Schutt joining us. Thank you. Now, Daryl Sittler let the secret out that he was a Montreal Canadian fan who happened to be drafted in the first round by the Maple Leafs. I know you're a Toronto kid uh, who played with the Montreal Canadiens. Who were you a fan of growing up? Well, obviously playing in, uh, living in Toronto. Uh, my heroes were, you know, Dave Keon, Frank Mahovlich, and uh, actually it was really pretty neat because the first training camp I look around who am I sitting right beside but Frank Mahovlich, one of my heroes so it was a great thrill for me. See some people think of the uh, Montreal Canadian days and you and uh, Billy Harris, Dave Gardner, Gardner, maybe one of the best junior lines ever, Harris, Gardner and Shutner, Shutt who won Memorial Cups with the Toronto Marlies so you won at the junior level you go right to the Montreal Canadiens you start winning Stanley Cups, 60 goal seasons playing with Guy Lafleur. Yeah I found, I found another good guy to play with. Well, I was gonna say yeah your partners <laughs> have been good well, but besides that what makes a winning team besides just talent? You were with winners. Well it's, it's uh, you know when you go into the dressing room you see uh, a guy like Henry Richard that won 11 Stanley Cups uh, and everybody's seen the size of Henry. Henry's about five foot eight and 160 pounds. You know, Ivan Cornoye won 10 Stanley Cups. And it's not size. It's what's it's what's inside you. That's that's what makes a winner. And you just look around at these guys, and you know you can't help but being inspired and and say, boy, if 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 they can do this, if they can succeed, uh, boy, I can do it too. I like the story you tell, uh, Henri Richard won all those Stanley Cups, yet the first year he retired, you won again and went to his bar. Well, we'd, uh, after he's won his 11th Stanley Cup, then he did retire, and uh, he did retire, we won a Stanley Cup again, so we went into his bar, we celebrated, and uh, we said, uh, yeah, Henry, we really missed you, <laughs> and uh, actually we, don't, we went on another string of four in a row, and you know, the thing was, Henry, uh, Henry could have played for at least another two of those years, uh, but you know Henry was a pretty proud guy. He was about 38 years old at time. He just would not take a supporting role, and so uh, he retired and, and instead of doing that. But he certainly could have won another two Stanley Cups. Now, are we back where it was when you played and Guy Lafleur played with the new rules and the quote new NHL that the uh, star players get a chance to show what you and Lafleur could do? Oh, it would have been great and uh, actually but you know really uh, the era that I played and you know myself and Daryl um, there was a lot less hooking and holding it was it was a pretty good era for for the skilled guys and and what happened was uh, um, actually one of my ex centermen which was uh, Jacques Lemaire who was uh, actually the the father of the trap I guess uh, he won a Stanley Cup in uh, New Jersey but just about ruined the NHL uh, in the process and it's taken about 10 years to get uh, his influence, uh, I guess, maybe out of the game. Steve Shutt, ladies and gentlemen, Hall of okay. Famer, Stanley Thank Cup you. champion. Thank you.
the respected policeman and undisputed heavyweight champion of the NHL from 1963 to 71, John Ferguson also contributed to the Canadians by scoring 145 goals and 303 points in 500 regular season games. He added 20 goals and 260 penalty minutes in 85 playoff games, helping the Habs to five Stanley Cups in eight seasons. Fergie was assistant coach to Harry Sinden with Team Canada 72 and is now special consultant to the GM of the San Jose Sharks. Ladies and gentlemen, John Ferguson. Now, beside being uh, Ryan's grandfather's favorite player, I think kind of a nice compliment from one of our ambassadors, the neat part is you're John Ferguson Sr. now. For about three months, it was John Ferguson Jr. and you were John Ferguson. Now it's flipped. <laughs> How does it feel? You're the guy that was the player, the general manager, and now you're the proud father. Well, I've been a senior ever since he's been a junior, and believe me, it's tough when you're checking in a hotel and you both got the same name, and someone gives you the wrong tuxedo to wear. So it's, uh, it's a little different. But I'd like to say that uh, I was at this dinner 33 years ago when Harold Ballard ran it uh, with King Clancy, and if I come back another th 33 years from now, I'll be 101. So that's kind of neat. Well, the dinner will be going. We hope you'll be here in 33 years as well. <laughs> uh, you know something? I was thinking that Wendell Clark auction, you're the guy that should be one of the 11 guys. That's your kind of hockey. Go to Wendell Yes, Clark. it is, Gordon, because I hate these new rules. I'm telling you that. <laughs> and it, we're playing no-touch basketball rules, and there's no strategy to the game. And if you're involved, I'm still involved with the San Jose Sharks. And believe me, when you lose six games at home with a shootout, when you got a full building, it's tough on you, believe me. you got to send the fans home happy. And we haven't been doing that lately. Now, you're the undisputed heavyweight from your era. Who would be the uh, toughest guys to fight? Well, the physical guys, whether fighters or the guys that gave you a uh, full quarter? Well, you had to be quick. And I was cocky in those days because I always said I'm quicker than Ali. And, uh, you know, the things it is now is, uh, you know, there's a lot of big, big fighters now. I'll tell you, even my guy Thornton got beat last night by Vandermeer from Chicago. But it's, uh, and the big guy in Ottawa took the deck there a little while ago, McGratton. Yeah. So you got to be on your toes. You got to be pretty strong now when they drop the gloves and throw them because, uh, you know, it's a tough game. But. You know, there's no checking in the corners anymore. You can't check, move guys out in front of the net. The good, great goalies, five on threes, they're blasted. The brodeurs and those people are all of a sudden average goalies. So it's tough. Well, we're getting a subtle message about the new <laughs> rules from you, John. I want to. Thanks, Gordon. I want to ask you, though, all those Stanley Cups, and then the, we got the Olympics coming up with the Summit Series 1972. You're the assistant coach. How do you view the two, winning Stanley Cups as a player and then that incredible series as an executive? Well, it, it really uh, was outstanding, you know, and it's, it's just uh, be with those players, and I've, I coach some of those players after Team Canada in 72, the Espositos, you know, and the Bergmans and so on and so forth. It was great, and it was almost as great as winning a Stanley Cup, and there, of course there's nothing like it. And, and uh, believe me, when you've uh, been on a Stanley Cup winner, it's, it's really a thrill. And I retired uh, winning a Stanley Cup in Chicago, and it was always nice to, re to retire with a champion. Thank you. Well, I'll tell you, a couple of surgeries, and you can't. He's a fighter all the way. You look like a million bucks. It's great to have the Ferguson name with the Maple Leaf organization. Thanks, Thank John. You. It was very nice of you. Thanks, John. He began his amateur freestyle wrestling career as a 16-year-old in 1990 and was a gold medal winner at the Nigerian Senior National Championships. African champion in 93, Daniel Agali represented Canada at the Commonwealth Games in 94 and elected to stay with his host family in Vancouver. Six years later, he draped himself in the Canadian flag, winning gold at the Summer Olympics in Sydney. And despite spinal fusion surgery in 03, miraculously competed at the 04 Athens Olympics. Daniel Agali, one determined golden champion. Daniel Agali, ladies and gentlemen. You know, there's certain defining Olympic moments, and uh, when you won the gold medal, not only you win the medal, but the whole thing with the flag, it was perfect. It was perfect about a guy who'd been some, through so many things to get here, a proud Canadian and a proud gold medalist. I mean, give us your whole thoughts about winning it and then why you did what you did and how you felt then. 
Well, you know, I, when I came in 1994 from Nigeria, um, my heroes were the Canadian athletes, the Canadian wrestlers. So in 1998, when I became a Canadian citizen and I was uh, qualified at the time to represent Canada, I went to my coaches and I wanted to know if we had world champions, Olympic champions, and, and they told me we didn't have any. And I think that was the biggest shock I ever had in my life because I was thinking to myself, if these were my heroes and they hadn't been able to do it, what chance did I have? So when it uh, became, um, um, when it realized, materialized for me in 2000, it was the, the happiest moment of my life. And I think it was the least thing I could do to salute Canada for what it had done to me. Well, we all appreciate it as Canadians, your pride in the country on that day. I think what's interesting is you're in the Olympics four years later, but maybe a lot of people can't remember, uh, in 2003 you have spinal fusion surgery. So a lot of what people like Ryan and Caitlin go through as far as those challenges, you have that and a year later you're competing once again. I mean that must have been an incredible accomplishment, an incredible ordeal. It was tough. It was tough having to uh, go through a major surgery like that just about eight months before the Olympics. But I, I felt uh, I didn't want to leave it to later to think of what, what could I have done if I had gone. So um, I had to go and I was happy that I went and uh, I, I didn't do too badly. I placed six and I think it's uh, remarkable for me at the time. Well, truly remarkable. I'm wondering with all these hockey people now from Nigeria, you ever think you could have been a hockey player? <laughs> a pesky centerman or something like that? I don't know, at five, six, one, fifty-five pounds, I don't know if I have a chance. <laughs> Well, we're glad you got the wrestling and the gold medals and your pride in Canada and your support of the Easter Seals. Daniel Legali, ladies and gentlemen. Thank, Thank you. you. A trailblazer for women's hockey, Geraldine Heaney spent 13 seasons with Canada's national women's team. A stalwart on defense, she left the international scene after the 02 Olympics with a gold medal, a silver medal, and seven world championships. At the time of her retirement from the national team, she had played the most games all time, 125, with Canada's national women's hockey team, leading all blue liners with 27 goals, 66 assists, and 93 points, fifth on the all-time list. One of the legends of women's hockey, Geraldine Heaney. You know, it's funny I say legend, you're not that old, but I mean, as far as the people that have uh, paved the path for the game and watching that game, we all expected one great gold medal game last time and we got two. In a lot of ways, the women's game supplanted the men's game for many of us. And for someone like you, was that the perfect defining moment for all the years and all the struggles and trying to get notoriety and all the sacrifice? Absolutely. When growing up being actually being a female, the chance of playing hockey and representing my country was very slim and for me I feel very fortunate that I had a chance to play the game of hockey and represent my country and to come home and, and win an Olympic gold medal is a dream that, you know, I'll never forget and you know, just looking at the young kids today with the disabilities and stuff and you know, you dream, dream big, and I dreamt as a child even though there wasn't a national team for me and I just kept dreaming and dreaming and dreams too come true. Do you feel good now? I mean, you're going to be watching the Winter Olympics for the first time. Does it feel okay? Oh, yeah. It, I mean, it's kind of interesting. It's, it's kind of nice to be on this side and be at home and watching my teammates over there in Italy. And, and, you know, it's going to be great when they come home because I believe they'll bring home another gold medal for Canada. Well, let's hope that's the case for sure on the men's and women's side and that for people over there. Uh, I want to ask you, John Ferguson was pretty blunt about not liking the new rules in the National Hockey League. How has women's hockey evolved? Is it a quicker game, a more physical game, like over the years that you've played? Well, actually, in 1990, it was full contact, and I kind of liked the way John Ferguson played the game, I guess, because I kind of like a little bit of the contact. But when you ask a lot of the public and the people, and they say that the women's game kind of brings back the memories of the original six, where you see a lot more of the skill during the game. You don't really see the clutch and grabbing, and obviously, you don't see much fighting in the women's game. And I think, it's kind of, I think it's great just to keep the women's game separate than the men's game. It is a different game, and I just think it's very enter a very entertaining game to watch. Do you like the fact that when it started, people talked about their uh, young girls would talk about Guy Lafleur or Daryl Sittler or whomever it would be, and uh, when young girls started talking about Geraldine Heaney being their idols, that must have been cool. Oh, I, th I think it's great. It's still hard to believe, and you know, you think back about all the hard work and everything that I put into the game, and I just think it's great, and it, it's great that they have female role models now. Well, congratulations on your success and thanks again for coming tonight. Geraldine Haney, ladies and gentlemen.
night is all about the Easter Seal Kids. You know, the tradition of this dinner revolves around the introduction of the Easter Seal Society's provincial ambassadors for the coming year. One young man and a young woman are selected by the Society to represent the 20,000 children in the province with physical disabilities. You know, it's truly another challenge for these ambassadors and their families as they're asked to travel across this province to various events to fulfill their role as a spokesperson for the society. Now, earlier tonight, you heard from Heather Stewart and Paul Manieri, the 2005 provincial ambassadors, about their unforgettable memories from their past year. And once again, I want to salute both Heather and Paul, if we could, for their work in 2005. And tonight, we are very fortunate to have several other past ambassadors seated at table 97 who have joined us tonight thanks to the generosity of Len Sancy of Oakland Ford Lincoln. I'm sure each of you have some very special memories and remarkable stories. Please let us salute you now. Congratulations for being such great ambassadors. Well, the tradition of this dinner continues. Tonight, we welcome two new ambassadors as they begin their year as spokespeople for the 20,000 kids with physical disabilities in Ontario. First, we are going to meet this very lovely young lady to my right. It's her optimistic outlook and public speaking abilities that have this attractive girl so well prepared for her important role with Easter Seals. You know, she was an ambassador for York Region last year. She was very comfortable talking to others and answering questions about her disability and the challenges faced by she and the many young adults like her. She credits the encouragement of her parents, Rhonda and John, for helping to achieve so much at such a young age. You can be sure that they, along with brother Nicholas and sister Madison, are very proud of her accomplishments and excited about her new responsibilities for the coming year. She is very nervous right now, and right now she's imagining all of you naked, which is not a very pretty picture, but it's calming her down incredibly. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the 2006 Provincial Easter Seal Ambassador, Caitlin Lenchak. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, honored guests, patrons of Easter Seals. Welcome to the premier sports celebrity dinner in Canada, the Siemens Con Smythe Sports Celebrity Dinners and Auction. My name is Caitlin Lenchak. I am honored to be chosen as one of the provincial Easter Seals ambassadors for 2006. Like other ambassadors before me, the responsibility is great, and it all starts this evening. It is a great thrill to be on stage with so many wonderful athletes. Like so many others, these men and women give back to the community, and we are all honored to have them here tonight. I would like to tell you a little bit about myself. I am 12 years old, I live in Aurora, I have an older brother, Nicholas, and a younger sister, Madison. That's right, I'm a middle child. <laughs> For all, oh, I was born three months premature, at 25 weeks, weighing only two pounds, the nurse says that I, that I was a fighter, small but mighty. It took a while for me to come home, but I made it. At the age of one, my parents were told I had cerebral palsy. It was then, East Shields came to my parents. They offered support and guidance, help that I would need later on in life. I used a walker to get around in public. I've had all sorts of physiotherapy. I had leg splints and a major operation on my legs and hips leaving me with all sorts of steel and pins in my legs. Airports are an adventure. <laughs> For all of this, I consider myself lucky. There are so many other kids who cannot accomplish some of those simple things in life because of their physical disability. I can swim, ski, play soccer, ice skate, hold a hockey stick, throw a baseball, a football, pass basketball, and I even wrestle my little sister. And I play cards. I'm looking for someone to teach me poker. <laughs> I 
I still have to learn to swing a golf club and try lacrosse. I am lucky I can do this all in my own special way. There are over 20,000 kids in Ontario living with physical disabilities. With your help, those kids can be lucky in their own special way. Your generous contributions can assist in East Shields funding camps for kids and in the Recreational Choice and Funding Program. It may help purchase a power wheelchair or a van lift. The cost could be as high as $25,000. Not many can afford that. East Shields can help. The next time you see a child in a wheelchair or walker or canes, it is natural to wonder why and what happened. But most importantly, you can stand tall with me and say, I've helped an East Shields child. We supported Easter Seals. Thank you. Enjoy the rest of the evening. Wonderful. Have the butterflies gone? Yeah. <laughs> now you can have a good time? Yeah, I think I could. Okay. Let's talk about, you know, you have an allergy. Yeah. And um, the, the term Nintendog, can, can you explain, I mean, you know, John Tavares and I, I mean, we're just not, you know, techies at all, obviously. <laughs> can you explain your Nintendog to, to me? My Nintendog is a virtual puppy that I have to train like a real dog. It poops, it pees and all that. <laughs> too, too much information. Okay, go ahead. My dogs, I have three dogs, a Labrador, a Pug, and a Siberian Husky. Their names are Alu, Avril, and Candy. Okay. And, you know, speaking of Avril, and tomorrow, I know you're going to be watching the, the Olympics, and I asked yeah. you, you know, you know, the opening ceremonies and everything, but you are a big fan of? Avril Lavigne. Yeah, so that little thing on your face is called a Madonna, but we're calling an Avril tonight, aren't we? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, congratulations. Great Thank speech. You. Relax. Let's have a, let's party now. The 55th Annual Siemens Con Smythe Sports Celebrities Dinner continues next with Daryl Sittler and Mike Foligno. A legend in women's golf, Sandra Post was the LPGA's Rookie of the Year in 1968 when at 19 she captured the LPGA Championship, the youngest person, male or female, to win a modern golf major. She won eight official and two unofficial events on the LPGA Tour and was second on the money list in 79 when she won the Lou Marsh Trophy as Canada's Athlete of the Year. Inducted into several sports and golf halls of fame, she was awarded the Order of Canada in 2003. Welcome, Sandra Post. Thank you. Thank you. Now, Sandra, we are thrilled to have you here tonight at the Consmite Dinner, but I understand from talking to you earlier, this is not the first time that no. you have been to a Consmite Dinner. You have quite a history, not only with Consmite Dinner and Easter Seals. Well, yes, I, I knew Consmite, like I'm sure a lot of the uh, people in the audience, but it was 1984 when I was here last. I, I, too long. I, I shouldn't have stayed away so long. Well, we're certainly glad to have you back. When you think back to your rookie season on the LPGA Tour, I mean, did you have any idea then that you would go on to the Hall of Fame career that you did? 
no, not really. I mean, you take it every day as it comes. Uh, you work harder than the next person, and um, if you do, uh, you expect to succeed. And I guess that's what I've always done. I mean, to think I have been a member of the LPGA for 38 years. I mean, I think about it. I was out there when I was 19 years old, and, and you know, we've got another big youth movement coming along on the LPGA Tour. Uh, but uh, so here we go again. I mean, it's very exciting right now for the LPGA Tour. Well, and you get to see it now in your role as a broadcaster. Tell us a bit about some of those young uh, women golfers that are coming up. Well, we're, and you know, thank goodness for CN. I mean, they have renewed the, co uh, the contract, there are new sponsors for our Canadian Women's Open. I know the RCJ is out here somewhere tonight, but uh, we're gonna be playing in London Hunt this year and uh, a big purse, a big nice jump there. And uh, you know, it's um, it's exciting for me to be able to see uh, the Morgan Pressels and, and uh, the Paula Creamers. And I don't believe Michelle Wee will be here. She's not on our tour yet, but she will be. Uh, I don't know if Annika will be coming to Canada or not, but uh, it's just really exciting right now. Well, and we are very excited that you could join us here Thank again tonight. You. We'll have you back. You won't have to wait another 20 okay. years for it. Thank Sandra you. Post, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Having lots of jump in his game, hard-nosed Mike Felino was always a fan favorite with the Red Wings, Sabres, Leafs, and Panthers because of the way he celebrated his goals. He'd leap into the air, tuck his knees to his chest, arms raised, and grin from ear to ear. Over 1,000 regular season games played with 355 goals and 727 points. He's now back at his native Sudbury as GM, head coach of the OHL Sudbury Wolves. videotape of that very unique celebration when when did that start did did you always have that jump to celebrate a goal you, you guys have had way too much to drink over there I'll tell you right now uh, you know it started in uh, junior hockey and uh, it's just something that kind of stayed with me and um, you know it's great jubilation obviously to score a goal and it's uh, something I, uh, I, I carried on in my career and it was a lot of fun to do well, after your 10 years in Buffalo, you come to Toronto, and who can forget the overtime goal against the Detroit Red Wings in 1993? I'm sure you have people come up to you and, and ask you about that. When, when you think about that moment, that game, that goal, what runs through your mind? Well, like, you know, I couldn't have done it without uh, some great help uh, from uh, some great teammates. And uh, the guys right over there, uh, Wendell Clark, who... Uh, broke his back on the wall uh, trying to make the pass to me and uh, found me in the slot and then I was able to put it away. But, uh, you know, we had a real close group that year. Um, it was probably the best time to ever play hockey in, in my career and it happened in a great city like Toronto. I know you're back now in your hometown of Sudbury as the GM and head coach of the Sudbury Wolves and you're also coaching your son Nicholas who's on the team. What's that like for you to be a coach but a hockey dad at the same time? Well, you, you wear a couple of different hats, there's no question about it, but, uh, you know, I, I try not to treat him any differently than I would, you know, the rest of my players. I, I kind of treat them all like my sons, and I guess Greg Gilbert would attest to that. He's over here in front of me here, but uh, he's a coach of the Mississauga Ice Dogs, and I'll tell you what, uh, it's a great thrill to coach. It's a privilege to coach players and uh, give them an opportunity to realize their dreams. And I know it's Nicholas's draft year. Do you think we may see another Felino in the National Hockey League? You know, only time, uh, only time will tell. Uh, you know, for uh, my wife and I, you know, we, we wish him nothing but the best. Well, we wish you nothing but the best. And Mike, again, thanks for joining us here tonight at the dinner. Mike Thank Felino, you. everyone. William John Smith began his NHL career with the Kings in 1971, but became one of the key foundations when the Islanders selected him in the 72 expansion draft. Combative, intense, and protective of his goal crease, Batlin Billy retired with the Islanders in 88-89 and left as one of the game's best ever money goalies, posting an 88-36 playoff record. He was a major part of the Islanders' dynasty that included four consecutive Stanley Cups from 1980 through 83 and inducted into the Hall of Fame in 1993. Be known as Batlin Billy Smith. Billy, you wouldn't even think twice about taking that goalie stick of yours and hacking it on the back of a guy's legs, would you? Well, you know, it's funny. Uh, 
everybody has an opinion about me, and I'm really a calm, gentle person. I mean, I'm a lot like what Jerry said tonight, you know, it's better the, to give than to receive. And that's just how I played. I gave. I really didn't like to receive, so we have something in common. Now, we're, we're reliving a lot of favorite hockey moments with a, a lot of uh, former NHL greats. Uh, your Hall of Fame career, part of those Islander dynasty years. What do you think of when you think back to your career and sort of reliving a lot of those memories tonight with a lot of the people here in this room? Well, it's funny, people. Like, I'm from a small town, uh, 5,000 population, Perth. If I ever thought I'd ever make the NHL, I would have been very surprised. And uh, I've been fortunate. I've... I've you know, won four cups. Uh, I won the Calder Trophy when I was just beginning. I never, I thought that was the greatest day in my life. And, you know, every day you get up, something new happens, something greater happens, and uh, I just hope it keeps going. You know, goaltenders this year, with the new rules, there, there have been a lot of new rules that have affected the goaltenders in many ways more than anyone else. They've shrunk their equipment. They're not allowed to play the puck as much as they used to. A lot of them are starting to complain about, you know, guys are being able to go after them. What do you think about the goaltenders today? Well, look at me, people. I'm a little roly-poly guy. You look at the guys, you know, today they're six foot two, five percent body fat. Jesus, I was five percent at ten years old, but the guys are in such great shape now. And I'm like Fergie. I'm old style. I believe violence is wonderful. You know, I'm sorry, a good fight, you know, let's show a little passion for this game. I mean, Fergie scared the hell out of me when I played against him. Let's show a little passion, let's be a little aggressive. I mean, never mind going in the third period and you're losing 5-1, not only the fans gone home, three quarters of the players have, you know, so let's get it going. Let's see a little enthusiasm. Okay, last question. Who do you think is the best goaltender in the league today? Berdur, no doubt about it. He's old-fashioned. He doesn't, he's not sliding around on his knees. He's, he's not blocking the puck. He's playing like I feel I play. Good sound goaltending. And we enjoyed watching it throughout your Hall of Fame career. Billy Smith, thank you for joining thank us you. here tonight, everybody. Billy Smith. If Blue Jays manager John Gibbons made out his lineup in alphabetical order, Russ Adams would be in the leadoff spot. And if Gibbons went strictly on merit, then Adams would still be atop the lineup. That is where the talented shortstop hit for most of the 05 season, starting more games than any other Toronto infielder. Adams hit 256 in his first full season with eight homers while driving in 63 runs and compiling a 325 on base percentage. He had seven less RBIs than New York Yankee shortstop Derek Jeter. We're thrilled to have Russ Adams joining us here tonight from the Toronto Blue Jays. Now, Russ, after completing your first full season with the Jays as shortstop, you're adjusting to life in the major leagues. You're also adjusting to life in Canada and the city of Toronto. How, how was your first season? Uh, it was really good. I, uh, I got to experience a lot of different things. Uh, you know, Canada is not much different than the States. I'm, you know, I'm from a small town, so being in a big city is a little bit different. Um, I got to uh, learn the life story of Sidney Crosby last year while I was here. Um, <laughs> But uh, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's an adjustment that you have to make, but uh, it's been a fun one and I'm enjoying being in Canada. Well, I know we were talking last night with Adrian Smith. The irony was Adrian had talked about baseball really being his first love and he ends up in football. Apparently, football was your first love. Tell me about that. <laughs> Yeah, well, I played a little bit in high school. Uh, wasn't wasn't nearly good enough to continue it past that. Uh, but I think I think Adrian and I both made the right choice as far as what direction we took. Yes, and Blue Jay fans are very happy that you did too. Speaking of the Blue Jays, they've been in the headlines almost daily with all of these great new signings. Even today, we hear they've uh, re-signed Shea Hillenbrand and Pete Walker. So many big names being added to the roster. Obviously, a lot of excitement towards this Blue Jay season. Uh, wh what are your thoughts as you head into this season? Well, uh, it was a really exciting uh, off season to watch. To sit back and check the internet every day and, and and see what's going on. It seemed like every every guy that we were after 
we got, and it was just one after another. And uh, you know, it was a lot of fun to walk to watch over the off season. I uh, I got down to Florida a few weeks ago and got a chance to talk to uh, Roy Halladay a little bit, and everybody's really excited. He's really excited, and he looks good. Um, you know, that's probably good news for everybody here. But uh, yeah, it, it's it's been a really fun off season, and uh, we've made some great additions, and hopefully, you know, that'll turn over into wins next year. And spring training uh, just around the corner. When will you head down to Florida and really get it all started? Well, uh, I'll, well I'm leaving here tomorrow to go right back down there. So uh, guys will start follow, like filing in uh, over the next week or so. Pitchers and catchers report in about a week, so we're ready to get it underway. Well, we love watching you with the Toronto Blue Jays. I know we were talking about, though, the Toronto Maple Leafs. You haven't been to a Leafs game yet. I, I think we need to rectify that. Perhaps there's somebody <laughs> at the head table sure that might be able to help out. I'm sure people here that can get me some free tickets or something. we got to work on that. But until then, we look forward to watching uh, Russ Adams with the Toronto Blue Jays. Russ, thank you for joining us here thank tonight. Thank you for having me. One of the most respected captains in NHL history, Daryl Sittler is the Maple Leafs' all-time regular season leader in points and goals. This year is the 30th anniversary of his NHL record 10-point game against the Bruins in February 76, his Stanley Cup record tying five-goal game against the Flyers in April that year, and his Canada Cup winning goal in overtime against Czechoslovakia in September 76. Inducted into the Hockey Hall of Fame at 89, the popular Sittler is a community representative for the Leafs. A legend, number 27 from the Toronto Maple Leafs. Please welcome Daryl Sittler. <laughs> Daryl, we we all enjoyed the 30th anniversary anniversary of that 10-point night for you. First of all, can you believe that that night was 30 years ago? Well. Probably a lot of people in this room can't believe it. I don't know where you were 30 years ago, but sitting on your Just dad's knee watching hockey. Yes, Canada with exactly. Your pajamas on or what? Absolutely. But it's it's nice to share that record. I said many times that if there's anybody that I thought might beat it would be Wayne Gretzky and Mario Lemieux, and going through the 80s when they were scoring 200 points a, a season. But uh, the fact that they got eight a couple of times, and here we are 30 years later with 10 and. You know, we talk about the rule changes, and I look at some of those that might uh, be an advantage for some player, future uh, player to possibly break it with the number of power plays and penalty kills, and they're talking about the goaltender's equipment smaller and all those sorts of things. But uh, it's one night that I don't know why it happened. It happened to me, and maybe it'll happen to somebody else, but I'm proud to hold the record. Now, I know because of the 30th anniversary, you, you were kind of reunited with Dave Reese, the goaltender who sadly was the victim of that night. What was it like for you to... To talk to him and, and when was the last time that you had talked to him? Well on the 25th anniversary uh, five years ago the fan radio had the two of us talking to each other hadn't met him and then TSN set it up uh, a week ago he came into Toronto we met at the Hall of Fame and it was nice uh, he's obviously uh, been a household name since that night he played 14 games in the National Hockey League and uh, he won seven of them but he, he just appreciates the fact like anybody might that he had the opportunity to play and he played for the Boston Bruins and as an American kid to make it was something good and and he has no regrets and he's a good sport about it. Well we heard Steve Shutt a little earlier talk about what it was like for him his rookie season to be sitting beside his idol in Frank Mahovlich. When you think back you said yourself you actually grew up a Montreal Canadiens fan but when you think of your rookie season I mean who was the guy that you were most excited to meet? Well, when I came to the Leaf dressing room, uh, I remember vividly, they pointed over there and, and there was a number 27. And we all know, like Steve mentioned, Frank Mahovlich and what he meant to the National Hockey League, but to the Leafs. So that was a, a tingle in my spine to think, here's a first round pick, they gave him number 27. And I felt good about that, but there was guys like Ronnie Ellis, a classy guy, Dave Keon was a captain, George Armstrong, Jacques Plant was playing. So we had a lot of role models and got a lot of players that had a total a lot of respect and, and the, for the history of the Toronto Maple Leafs and the tradition, not only like the Canadians carried in that rubbed off and rookies like myself. When you think of the history of the Toronto Maple Leafs and, and obviously this dinner being a big part of that, we heard John Ferguson talk about having been at this dinner and Harold Ballard being at it. When you think back to Harold Ballard, what memories come to your mind? Well, Honestly, I was at this dinner back when I was going through some struggles with the Leafs and I was sitting down in the seats like pinball is tonight. Um, and Harold Ballard was up here on the microphone and he gave me quite a shot about me being, uh, I don't know, whatever, 
he wanted to call me. And I'll always remember that night because I didn't think it was fair. But, you know, I'm 55 years old and I look at this as the 55th anniversary of this event. And, and I feel I've been around for a long time. And it's wonderful to see the tradition and the support continue to go on. And we got young life and new life in here. And we have old people and that continue to support it. And I think it's important that we continue this tradition. And yeah, the evening's long and, uh, and you hear lots of speeches and all that sort of thing. But at the end of the day, you're raising a lot of money to give wheelchairs and support for these programs for these young kids that are our future leaders. So thank you very much. And it's a great an honor for me to be a part of it again, as it is every year. Couldn't have said it any better. A wonderful way to end the evening. Daryl Sittler, thank you so much for your involvement again this evening. Darryl. You're watching the 55th Annual Siemens Con Smythe Sports Celebrities Dinner. Ladies and gentlemen, the Easter Seal Society is determined to help children make a life for themselves. We've heard from Caitlin, we've heard from Ryan. We know what they want in life. We know what they can be. They're well-spoken. They have great intentions for the future. And you have helped them by being here to make their future more secure. We look forward now to their year as ambassadors, and I know it's going to be a fabulous 2006, to Caitlin and to Ryan. Guys, you rock. Have a great year. Big hand for them. I thank you for coming out and spending time with us and spending your money because it's very important. And I want you to come back to next year's Con Smite Dinner. There's celebrity dinner. There's going to be another terrific head table. It's going to be another great silent auction. I'd like you now, please, if you would, to rise and help me salute this head table as they exit the ballroom. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for coming to the 2006 Consmite Celebrity Sports Center. I'm Rob Fultz. Take care, everybody. Thank you. <laughs>